What does it mean to repent and believe? Well, we're talking about that in our Commands of Christ series today. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time visiting with us, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to taking God's Word and making it simple. We want to help you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. Also, if you appreciate this ministry and content, at some point make sure and hit that subscribe button, turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. We would love to have you as part of our family. Okay guys, welcome back. So if you didn't catch my intro for this series, make sure you watch that as well as the two videos on the 411. This section will not make any sense without those videos, so please, I know I'm asking you to watch three videos, but please go back and check out those three videos so that you can follow along with us and actually benefit from this series. All right, so following our paper, whether you have a PDF copy that you're just digitally scrolling or whether you're like me and you like having a physical piece of paper and you printed it out, the first thing, if we were in a small group, there'd probably be a few of us around and we would just start off talking, you know, hey, how are you guys doing? How is life going? How can I be praying for you? And so on and trying to encourage each other. And you see that outlined under the section care. And then the next thing is loving accountability, right? There's no point in saying that we're following Christ if it's just words, right? The talk is cheap, as the old saying goes. So we need to hold each other accountable, but not in a, hey, did you do everything that you were supposed to? And if not, I'm going to beat you with this board. Um, that's not the kind of accountability we're talking about. We're talking about loving accountability. You know, hey, um, you know, your fish and follow goals that you set last week, specifically Mark 117 is the scripture reference for that. Um, have you had that gospel conversation yet? Have you talked with that person that you mentioned and we've been praying for? Well, why not? You know, okay, maybe you were a little bit nervous. Well, I want to encourage you to, you know, to be bold this coming week. Or maybe you just didn't see them. Okay, well, you know, I, I, I think it would probably be good to make a point, find an excuse to see them this coming week. That's loving accountability. You're trying to help somebody accomplish their goals. Because as the old saying goes, goals we set are goals we get, right? If we, don't, if we don't work toward our goals, if we don't set goals and then work toward them, we're never going to achieve them. So loving accountability means encouraging our, us to achieve those goals and helping people overcome the obstacles that prevent them from doing so. All right, now the next section on your paper is called vision. So each week, I believe, every single week, yes, each week we're going to review the church circle. Now, I included the church circle video in my 411 training last week, so catch uh, that video if you didn't already. And again, you really need to watch all three videos before watching this because it won't make any sense. Um, but every week you want to practice th the church circle. Now, if I were doing this in person, we'd be able to draw it together. Like I'd probably get up on the whiteboard and draw the circle and do all the things that we do in that video. Um, it's not reasonable for me to do that on every video as we do this. So I'm just going to keep pointing you back to that. I really want you to get some practice in with the church circle. Okay, so the next section here is the vision section. And each week, I think every week, if I remember correct, literally every single week, we're going to be doing the church circle. Now, if we were doing this in person, I'd grab my whiteboard and we would talk this through together. We would take turns. I would have people do it on the paper in front of them and then come up to the whiteboard and all of that because practice is what we need to become better at what we're doing. Uh, you're probably thinking, yeah, Aaron, the phrase is called practice makes perfect. Well, actually, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfecter, right? If we practice something poorly, it doesn't make us perfect. It just means we're really good at doing it bad. So good practice helps us become better. If you've never thought about that phrase before, yeah, I just kind of threw the grenade in there. But anyway, um, in this series, as we're doing the commands of Christ, it's not practical for me to do that with you every single week. So I want you to check out that video. I, I made a standalone video for the church circle, and I just want you to check that out. And I would encourage you, if you want the maximum benefit here, 
please go back and watch that video each week and practice it yourself. That's where I was talking in the intro to this series where you're not gonna get the maximum benefit when we're doing this online virtually compared to doing it in person. So it's up to you whether you're gonna get those reps in or not. All right, so then we'll move on to Mark chapter one. So Matthew, Mark, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark. If you are using a digital Bible, obviously you can just scroll until you find it. But if you are using a physical Bible, then it's in the New Testament, and you may already know this, but it's Matthew and then Mark for the New Testament. So in Mark chapter one, verse 15, we'll read this together. Um, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And this is a command that is repeated in one manner or another all through the New Testament. This is one example of that command. What is it to repent and believe? Well, we're going to talk about it. So now we'll turn to Luke. So Matthew, Mark, Luke. So give me a second to get there. Luke 19. 1 through 10. So we're going to read a story about someone who is involved in what it means to repent and believe. So uh, Luke 19, 1 through 10. Uh, my Bible has the phrase above the text, Zacchaeus converted. Check out my video, The Numbers Are a Lie. The um, chapter and verses were not in the original text. These were letters written from someone to someone inspired by God. Um, you can check out my video series, Four Secrets to Life and the Bible. Um, you're going to end up down a rabbit hole watching those videos. So maybe bookmark or at the end of the video, click what you need to, to see the recommended videos. Um, but those would be important ones to watch if you're new to the faith or have never been discipled. Um, so the phrase Zacchaeus converted is not part of scripture. That's something an editor put in there, but it does help us. So uh, Luke 19, 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through Jesus. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Now tax collectors were not appreciated in the New Testament. So um, they were typically corrupt. Um, and that's, I don't need to go into more detail than that. Just understand this would be like a corrupt IRS agent. The way that Americans would feel about that, that's how they would have felt about the uh, tax collectors. Verse 3, Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and when, was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature, or as we might say, he was vertically challenged. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. So Zacchaeus obviously had heard of Jesus. He was curious about who this man is, what is it that he's teaching. So he wanted to make sure that he got firsthand knowledge. I think that's a good pattern for someone that wants to grow in their faith. And how we get firsthand knowledge is ultimately through being saved, which is what we're talking about, repent and believe, but through the scriptures themselves. That's how we get firsthand knowledge right now. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Notice he didn't ask. He said, I must, right? We're, we're doing this, buddy. Come on. Um, Zacchaeus wasn't complaining, by the way. Jesus knows all things. Verse 6, And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Well, of course, he wanted to understand who Jesus was, what he taught, and Jesus kind of invited himself over. It could be rude, except Jesus knew that that's what Zacchaeus wanted. When they saw it, the crowds, when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Again, this would have been someone that the people despised, and Jesus chose him, of all people, to spend extra time with. <laughs> See, Jesus often does things that we don't expect because our way of thinking is affected by sin. Jesus sees through spiritual eyes and is not affected by sin. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stooped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. See, repentance by definition means recognizing the problem, recognizing your own sinfulness, and turning from that 
180 degrees from one thing to another. That's the definition of repentance, is turning from sin toward God. You don't just turn from sin. You can't only turn toward God. You have to turn from sin toward God. You must recognize that you have sinned, you have done wrong, that you deserve punishment, but you're also recognizing God and His ability to forgive you of sin. So he offers, he understands his corruption, so he offers to not only give back, but give back with interest four times as much of anyone he has defrauded. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Not because he was willing to give his stuff away, that's not the point. There's a lot more context here, and we just don't have time today to get into more context. That's another reason that this type of discipleship is best done in person so that we can ask these questions. So please feel free to ask questions down in the comments. I will get an answer to you as quickly as I am able to. So he offers to give back and Jesus recognizing his repentance, not the fact that he gave stuff away, but the fact that giving that stuff away demonstrated what happened in his heart. So Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So this is the purpose of Jesus coming. And then we also have in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. So give me a second to get over to Luke chapter 7. All right, Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Now, one of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees would have been the religious leaders at the time, so they would have been considered people that are supposed to have all the answers, the religious elite, if you will. Now, one of the Pharisees, was, and by the way, Jesus didn't generally agree with the Pharisees, so that should be a lesson to us that it's really easy to miss the point when we're studying Scripture. It's really easy to miss the point and actually end up turning people away from God instead of toward Him. A different story, different day. I just If you don't know who the Pharisees are, I just wanted you to understand that right now. So now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. So we just saw Jesus invite himself to live or not live, but uh, dine with the tax collector. In this case, one of the Pharisees is asking Jesus, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, they would have actually laid down typically. They don't sit up straight like a European uh, ancestry has taught us to do. Um, but they actually would have reclined. It's an arid environment, different culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But bottom line, he, we would say he sat down at the table, but technically they would have reclined. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. So the religious elite invites Jesus over and he agrees. And now we have this woman who's a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And this would have been exceedingly expensive. I don't remember if this section, I don't think this section um, covers it. One of the other sections that talk about this woman covers it. But that would have been an exceedingly valuable thing to to have with you to purchase so in other words this would have realistically represented her life savings um, so she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing before him at his feet weeping she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume so this woman who is a sinner, and we don't know what kind of sinner. A lot of people assume that she was a harlot. We don't really know. It just says a woman who was a sinner. So just be careful with that. We want to let Scripture speak and not assume something that Scripture actually doesn't say, um, at least not in this passage. We don't explicitly know what her sin was. We can think about it. We can. I would say we want to assume, but we don't want to assume. That's kind of the point that I'm making. Anyway... Basically, this woman is so broken over her sin that she's just a sobbing mess. I mean, this is very... I can't imagine being Jesus in that moment. If I was somewhere and somebody came to me and started crying on my feet and wiping my feet with their hair, that would be freaky. Well, for two reasons. One, because our culture doesn't do foot washing. But two... You just don't know what to do with that. It's not normal for someone to do that. 
So let me break this down. In their culture, it was an arid environment. They typically would have worn sandals, so your feet would get dry and cracked. So a show of hospitality in a home was when somebody comes to you, you wash their feet, or at the very least provide for their feet to be washed. And it was not unusual to anoint their feet with oil of some sort. You would also see in other places anointing of the head and things like that. Basically, it's the same thing we would do to use lotion. Like, like if you've got a mudroom, if you live somewhere that has a mudroom, whether you're in the south and that means literal, literally just mud from being around in the woods or up north, typically that would be maybe mud during the summer, but the snow and slosh during the winter. It's kind of the same concept. It's, it's normal to have a dedicated moment to just get cleaned up before you come into the house of the person you're visiting, and in their culture, you would have provided the equivalent of lotion, the anointing oil. However, in this case, the oil that she's using is an absurdly expensive thing, and a very, even the box was expensive, much less the oil itself. So, uh, let's see. So she, she brought an alabaster uh, vial of perfume, standing behind him at his feet weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair on, with the hair on her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee, so you want to know the character, you want to know someone's character, see how they respond to things. This Pharisee is going to respond, and we're going to know a lot about his character. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, so he's judging Jesus, right? How ironic is that? He's actually judging Jesus. If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching them, him, that, he's a, that she is a sinner. And mind you, Pharisees weren't allowed to touch women, period, much less sinful people. So there's very much the arrogant, looking down on people kind of judgment. And then verse 40, Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. This isn't Simon Peter. This is a different Simon. And he replied, say it, teacher. So he's thinking to himself, ooh, man, she's a sinner. And what's up with Jesus allowing this, right? Jesus knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart, even when we don't say it. Demonstrating that here, he's like, hey, uh, I have something to say to you. And he's like, oh, okay, go ahead. Not realizing that Jesus understands his heart. He says, a money lender has two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii was roughly equal to a day's wage. So whatever your daily wage is, not literally, but just for the sake of understanding, a daily wage. Uh, and the other owed 50. So one owed 500 days wages and the second one owed 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? So basically, hey, there's this person that somebody owes them 500 days wages and somebody else owes them 50 days wages. He forgives them because neither of them can pay it back. Who's going to love him more? That's how Jesus is asking this question. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he, Jesus, and he said to him, you have judged correctly. Uh, yeah, they're, we might say appreciate more, right? We tend to use love in a slightly different way than the way it's used here. We would usually wor use the, the word appreciate, like love in the sense of appreciation, right? Although love is appropriate here because it's a parallel for the gospel. Anyway, verse 44, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, uh, but she has wet, her, wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You, and by the way, a religious elite should be the most hospitable person in the world. So Jesus is condemning him here. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time that it would have been customary to kiss on the cheeks. We think about that as a European thing, but it would have been part of their culture at this point. So uh, you gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many... Jesus isn't denying the sinfulness of this woman. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. 
Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. So the Pharisee is judging everyone in his heart. Doesn't say a word, he's just judging people. And Jesus responds with this parable. But that's not the main purpose right now. What we want you to understand is the repentance. This woman is so broken by what she has done. And this perfume that is of extreme value is poured out and used to anoint Jesus to take care of him because she's recognizing that he is the only one that can forgive sins and she's recognizing her sinfulness. She is, it's implied, she's turning away from her sin. She's willing to make it right by giving up the uh, proceeds of her evil and willing to literally throw herself at Jesus' feet. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So we see in this story the definition of repentance as exampled or as given through these two examples. As I said in the beginning, it means turning from sin toward God. It's a recognition that I have sinned. I deserve punishment. I'm not worthy. But Christ, you have the ability to forgive sins, and I, I am throwing myself at your mercy. I'm not trying to justify myself. I'm not trying to say, well, I'm a good enough person. No. I'm saying I am not a good enough person. I don't deserve to stand in your presence. I deserve whatever punishment might come my way, and I am sorry for what I have done. That's what it means to repent and to believe. All right, so I've kind of done teaching as I read because I know this material very well, and I just tend to do that as I read because I've developed the habits that are taught here. Um, so the next thing says to read the story aloud, which we just did. And then the next thing is number four under scripture to discover. And what do we mean by that? Well, first we pray. And when we pray, we're asking God to help us understand. And Specifically, we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is the one. God, we don't understand it, but God, through the Holy Spirit, helps us understand His written Word. So when we pray, we ask God to help us understand. So if you will join me in pray, and, and frankly, I would tend to pray at the beginning before I read, um, I think that's a good habit to get into before we read. I always pray before I do these videos, so I don't tend to model that very well on the videos because I've already done it. Uh, again, a drawback of doing this virtually instead of in person, but again, better than nothing. So let's pray together and then we'll discuss some of this. So, uh, And by the way, your prayers don't have to be fancy. Something really simple gets the job done, right? As you mature, you probably will speak differently, uh, just like a child speaks differently than an adult. But something very simple, just say, you know, God, help me to understand what you want me to know as I read and think about your word. Help me to grow and to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Short and sweet, as long as you mean it in your heart, you're talking to God. He understands. He knows. So again, I would do that in the very beginning. Um, I didn't even think about the fact that this does it here. I would say do that in the very beginning before you even read God's Word. Then read the Word and then go through the discovery questions. So we'll use the Bible discovery questions below to discuss the story and reveal its meaning for our lives. And again, we're dependent on God for true understanding. So we simply ask some questions. What do we learn from, uh, what do we learn from the story about God? And this would be we're in a small group. We'd each, you know, take turns answering a few things. You might even write it up on the board if you were doing this in a small group context. So, you know, somebody might say, well, uh, I mean, Jesus is God because he was able to forgive sins. The person even said... Um, who is this man that even forgives sins? That's something that's only something that God can do. So clearly God is, Jesus is God. Um, we also understand that Jesus doesn't like fake religion, right? God doesn't like fake religion because he condemns the Pharisee for his bad attitude and he's compassionate and loving toward the person who has repented and believed. 
That's something else that we learn about God. And we can go through a few different things. So you can let me know in the comments, what are some things you learn about God from these two passages? Let me know down below if there's something else that you notice. Take that chance to practice and really think through it. The second question, what do we learn about people in the story? Well, there's fake religion, and then there is real repentance and belief. That's a very easy one that we can learn from these two stories, right? Obviously, I'm speaking more of the second because we just read that one, but there's fake religion. There are lots of people who are the religious elite that may not actually even be people of faith. They're just really good at saying what sound like the right words at the right time and probably don't even have real faith. Whereas the woman that nobody would have expected repents and believes and is now a Christian and actually encouraged and, and receives the compassion of Christ. Is there anything from the story Jesus wants us to obey? Well, clearly repenting and believing is something that is modeled in the story, right? Same thing with Zacchaeus. And also notice that they make amends for the things that they've done wrong, right? She has purchased this oil with, or perfume, same difference, it would have been perfumed oil. She's purchased this with money from things that we presume, I'm assuming, I don't actually know because it doesn't explicitly say it, but it's a very reasonable assumption. But with Zacchaeus, for sure, he just flat out says, look, I got to repay a bunch of people. Anything that I have gotten from uh, sinful means, I'm going to pay back four times. I mean, that's just amazing. But that's a repentant heart. See, when you come to the end of yourself and you say, you know what, I deserve the judgment of God, then anything is worth it because your heart just wants to be right with God. So repent and believe typically also involves making amends for the things that you have done wrong when and where possible. And for the times where it's no longer possible, then you just have to trust in the grace of God. So that's something that we should be obeying. And there's probably others that we can observe through this, like pursuing Jesus, investigating directly from Jesus, which in the modern day would mean through prayer, but more through the scriptures themselves, because that's something I can know with certainty. I can talk to God and whatever thought pops in my head, that might be God, it might be the dinner I ate last night or the something I ate this morning, right? It's subjective. The word of God is not subjective. So that's why uh, we put an emphasis on the written word of God. Then I'm going to practice. I want to tell the story. So now is your chance. I want you to retell the story. So pause the video, take a few seconds and retell the story. How would you explain the story of Zacchaeus? Okay, so hopefully you paused it and actually practiced. If you're like most people, you just kept watching. It's okay, but you're getting out of this what you put into it. So I would encourage you, if you didn't, take some time to actually practice. You know, how do I describe the story of Zacchaeus? I could just paraphrase it for my own benefit. Well, there was a guy named Zacchaeus, and he really wanted to know who Jesus was. He heard he was coming to town, and he made sure that he met Jesus. And then he actually had dinner with Jesus, and he repented right there on the spot and gave back everything that he stole and tried to make up for how he deceived people. That would be an example of retelling the story of Zacchaeus. And then do the same thing with the woman with the perfume and the Pharisee. All right, the next thing, explore more. What does repent mean? Well, we've observed through scripture, but now let's put words to our definition. So, and by the way, you could have other definitions that are accurate. The specific wording just comes from the people that put this together. Repent means turning from sin and following Jesus. So I've already defined that. Here's another definition. It says the same thing. Two, what does believe mean? Believe means choosing to trust Jesus as Lord. Not just I acknowledge that Jesus existed, but to trust him as Lord, to choose to follow him no matter the cost, to acknowledge that he is God, that he can do what he promised he can do, that he's who he says he is and he can do what he's promised he can do. Why should we repent? Well, we can read Romans chapter 3, so turn quickly to Romans. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. 
And this is one that a lot of Christians have memorized. If you don't, that's okay. But just for reference, a lot of Christians have this one memorized. So why should we repent? Well, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So everybody has messed up. Everybody has done things that violate God's law. Any honest person doesn't have to be convinced of that. We all know that we've done things that are wrong. We tend to want to justify it, but we all know that we've done wrong things. And then turn over to 6.23, so usually just a page or so over. 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So we've all sinned. We can agree on that, right? Yeah. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if we can agree that we've all sinned, what does that mean? Well, here in verse 23 of chapter 6, God is telling us that when we sin, we now are going to be punished. The cost is death. So we earn death by sinning. That's the punishment for sin. But the free gift of God, it doesn't cost us anything. Jesus offers it freely, we just have to accept. But the free gift of God is eternal life. So it's not just talking, when it says the wages of sin is death, it's not just talking about um, physical life, it's talking about eternal life. In other words, separation from God in a place known as hell, the place where people are punished for all eternity if they don't believe in Christ. So for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then turn just a little bit more to chapter 10, verse 9. And we read that if you confess, so how do we get out of this predicament? If you confess with your mouth, mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, that's only true if the other stuff has been done. The recognition of your sin, the recognition and agreement with God that you deserve punishment because you've sinned and the punishment for sin is death. You have to acknowledge and agree with those things. But if you do, it says, if then if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. In other words, I know Jesus can save me. And believe in your heart. So it's not just intellectual. It's also a genuine belief in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. In other words, that Jesus has the power to forgive sin, right? If Jesus can't raise, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then we can't be saved eternally because then he wouldn't have the power to do it. So if you believe Jesus is who he says he is and that he can do what he said he can do, then you will be saved right here in verse 9. So that's who should repent. Who? Everyone. Anyone and everyone should repent. Uh, verse 4 is the who. And I already answered that, Acts 2, 28 through 41. Everyone must repent for forgiveness. And then the question is, well, how do I know it's real? How do I know uh, that it'll last? How do I know it's true? Well, first off, the Spirit, if you have had a genuine conversion, the Spirit will uh, minister to you in a way that we can't really explain to confirm to you the truthfulness. Um, but also we see in 1 John that it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us. And in John 10, 28, it says that our salvation belongs to Jesus. So in other words, if we've truly been saved, then we can have confidence that Jesus will do what he said he would do that he's not a liar, that he's genuine, that he's real, that he really will provide that uh, way of escape. And ultimately, that means being in fellowship with him in heaven. But do you see how it's not really about hell and it's not really about heaven? It's about an acknowledgement that I've broken God's commandments and therefore I can't be in fellowship with God. But if I repent and believe, then I can be in fellowship with God again. All right. The last section, the, the last third, if you will, on this page is to set goals. So fish, going back to our Mark passage, fish, who will you share the gospel or a gospel conversation? Who will you share with this week? And this should be someone from your Oikos map. I know that's a weird word, but if you watch the original intro video to the series, the 411, then you know who, what I'm talking about with the Oikos map.
So who are you going to share with? We want to target specific people because generally speaking, this isn't something you can just talk about with strangers. Now, some people are very gifted at that. Most people are not. This is usually someone that you know and you have some form of a relationship with to earn the right to have these conversations. So who is it? Set the goal. I want you to write it down on your piece of paper. I'm going to talk to this person by this date. Remember, we did that originally in our 411 training. The next thing, follow. From what today's lesson, or from what from today's lesson does Jesus want you to obey this week? So you are the only one that can actually answer that one. I can't answer that for you. So thinking through the lesson, what is it that we need to do this week in order to be obedient to Christ? Maybe it's to repent and believe for the first time. Maybe it's that there's someone out there you know that you haven't spoken with that you need to. Maybe there's some other sin when we talked about repenting from sin and you're like, oh, I forgot about that, Lord, I'm so sorry. And you need to repent of that specific sin. That's okay. Go ahead and take the time to do that. And then the commissioning, that means to pray and ask God for his power to help you obey these goals. And again, I could give you a much prettier, flowery prayer, but keep your prayers basic at first. Don't try to compete with other people. It's not about competition, it's about talking to God. So your prayer can very much be something like this. God, I recognize that I have sinned in this way and I need to repent of this specific sin and I ask you to forgive me of that sin. And Lord, please help me not to do that sin anymore. Lord, give me your strength to avoid that sin and not to fall into that sin anymore. And Lord, also help me to be able to speak with this person. Ideally, I'd like to talk to him at this time. So help me to be able to have time this week to talk with that person about you. And I'm praying ahead of time that their heart would be ready for that conversation and that you would reach them and that they too would repent and believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Very simple prayer, not complicated. Of course, you can talk more, you can use different language, but that's the essence of what it means to pray along those lines. So guys, I know this is a long video and I'm kind of curious who's actually gonna watch these videos. If you've watched till the end, let me know in the comments still here so that I know that you have watched through to the end. And also give me your feedback on this series. I'm gonna be recording this series regardless because I think it's that important. But I do wanna know your comments. I know these are longer videos, but I think they're so important. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. As always, if you appreciate this ministry and this content, make sure and hit like, subscribe, turn this uh, or turn that bell notification to all so you don't miss any future videos. And hey, share this video with somebody, right? That's one of the ways that you can help reach that other person is share these videos with them so that they too can benefit from this information. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you very much and God bless.